Good morning, everyone. This is Lori Moore Merrill, and I'm sure that Dr. England has already made appropriate introduction. And I wanted to say to you all that I, I so miss being there with you. Unfortunately, we had a schedule conflict, and I am in Cincinnati at the International Association of Firefighters uh, Biennial Convention. And so uh, we are, are extremely busy here. We had even hope to do some sort of Skype with you this morning so that I could say hello and see you and, and have you see me and, and have a, a good conversation. But unfortunately, uh, always technology doesn't give us the uh, cooperation that we had hoped for. So I will spend my time with you this way in a, a recorded manner and hope to see you all again very soon. So Dr. England had asked me to speak about uh, some EMS issues, and I think this is one of the subjects that is so timely for all of the fire services across, all the fire departments across the U.S., particularly as we watch the change in the face of health care that is delivered outside the hospital arena. And for fire-based EMS systems, this is going to be, and is even now, a very real paradigm shift. It's a change in the way that we have traditionally known fire-based EMS to be delivered in the 911 emergency response type system. And so here's what we know as we get into this um, a little bit more. Why, where is this, uh, where's the impetus for this change in the way that we deliver fire-based EMS? Well, the impetus really started with the Affordable Care Act. And as that act was passed, uh, frankly, the act says really nothing at all, uh, or very minimal even mentions of emergency care outside of the hospital, but it does open up opportunities um, within the EMS arena by the way the language is written about other health care deliveries, about things that are required of hospitals, things that are required of physicians, and so with these types of, of items written into the law, it opens up some real, very real opportunities for fire departments. And so we need to start, though, by understanding first what were the real criteria, uh, the key points, if you will, of the Affordable Care Act. And that was really to reduce the number of un uninsured throughout America, to enhance the quality of the care that is delivered in all the venues, and also to expand benefits to those individuals who were not uh, covered or those who were covered to have ex expanded benefits to include things like their children until they're age 26 staying on a parent's health care, to include things like primary care or um, annual uh, mammograms, things that we know to be of um, necessity to many in our population. And so that was the real impetus as the Affordable Care Act came to be, is to assure that health care became something that everyone had access and opportunity, if you will, to to gain, um, it's almost a right to health care rather than it being uh, just something that uh, was available to those who could afford it or to the very, very poor who then would live on uh, whether it's Medicare or uh, Medicaid in certain examples of those uh, of our elderly population. And so with that being the case, as I said, the law opened up opportunities for EMS. And what are some of those opportunities? Well, well, here is what we know. Um, there are not enough primary providers throughout the U.S. for this large influx of newly insured people. The emergency department we know has filled the void in the past, but we also know how busy our emergency rooms are and how expensive that uh, venue of care can be. And so the Affordable Care Act really looks to reduce cost as well uh, by increasing competition. And so you're going to begin to see this population look for primary care providers. They will still go to the emergency rooms when they have the opportunity. So it's still going to be weighing on our emergency response systems to some extent. And then there's this new uh, grouping, if you will, of uh, healthcare organizations. And that's called the Accountable Care Organizations. Now what this really is, is sort of an umbrella of everything that you have known in the past. You know how when you would go to 
the hospital or go to your doctor, they may send you down the street to get an x-ray or they'll send you, you know, across town to get your blood drawn at different facilities. Well, these accountable care organizations really become an umbrella organization that now owns all of those things. They own the hospital, they own the doctors, um, or they contract with, you know, physician groups. They also own the x-ray groups. They own all of the blood drawn groups. You know, all of these different things are under one umbrella. And so that was part of the, the way the Affordable Care Act outlined for these accountable care organizations then to not only monitor quality, which as you recall was one of the, the primary um, criteria in the, the Affordable Care Act, but also to hold down costs. And so this is, these are some of the things that we know. So these uh, are the, uh, the situations that sort of lend themselves to some changes in fire-based EMS as well. So what do we call it? We've called it traditionally community paramedic, but what is happening in the industry is that we have groups that are beginning to call it the mobile integrated health care. We still kind of call it community paramedic, sort of as an alias, but I think it can be both. So I just want everybody to be alert to either of these names, whether it's mobile integrated health care or community paramedic. We're really talking about the same type of thing. Uh, one of the, the criteria and the reason that we use mobile integrated health care is because what we're discovering is that many of the skills that are being used for some of the services that I'm going to tell you about can be done by an EMT, frankly, uh, a firefighter EMT. They don't have to be ALS level, advanced life support level, or paramedics. And so that's some of the, the impetus for the word changing or, or why we refer to it in both of these venues. So let's talk about mobile integrated health for a little bit. This really comes to be a patient focused um, navigation. You know, I told you about the affordable or the accountable care um, op organizations. But within that, you still have to navigate the system. And so there is uh, an opportunity for us in the pre-hospital environment, long before a patient even enters these ACOs or in the true health care arena, for us to do some help with navigating them through it, um, to be able to focus on specific care, to um, you know send them to the appropriate care facility, whether it's a chest pain center for those, or a cardiac care center, or a specialized stroke center. Do you see how even mentioning those things, you might think, well, yes, if I'm transporting a patient from a fire-based CMS system, I know what's wrong with the patient. I can better direct them to the best. Uh, venue of care so that once they get to a hospital they're not then shipped to another hospital who can better meet their needs. We can actually do that from the pre-hospital arena. Also I'm um, looking at leveraging some partnerships that's going to be some real opportunity that we may have in some of our systems and then uh, looking at multidisciplinary teams and what that really is referring to is maybe us working with nurses uh, in some of the, uh, the cities, some of the venues that we may have opportunity uh, to work with some of the programs. So defining a community paramedic, again we're still talking about mobile integrated health care, but defining a, what is a community paramedic or even an EMT as I said. Well in uh, a lot of states what we're seeing is this is still a licensed or certified paramedic with some additional training. Maybe it's some additional um, education in disease process, maybe it is some more education in prevention, um, medical system navigation, which I just mentioned to you, how do I better orchestrate or navigate a um, patient through the system. Um, looking at the population that we might serve in this arena, this is again outside the emergency response arena, which has been our typical venue. What we're talking about is reaching out to the elderly population, those who may call 911 for many, many reasons, not necessarily an emergency, right? Um, the underserved, those who don't want to go to their neighborhood clinics and wait in line, or those who have traditionally, instead of doing that, called 911 to get to the ER because they think if they ride an ambulance in, they can get first in line. And so these are the folks that we're talking about, also the chronic uh, conditions things that we know, your COPD patients, your diabetics, uh, these are really the, the chronic condition patients that are very costly to the healthcare system and so there's some real opportunity for us in the EMS arena to drive down costs while helping these types of patients really lead a better um, and healthier life without so many um, health issues just with a little bit of coaching and someone checking on them regularly. So 
Well, what might we do? Well, as I just mentioned, some of that uh, chronic disease monitoring, maybe we go and check and make sure that our COPD patients that we know are, ch are taking their prescription medicines. Maybe we, uh, after they're discharged from the hospital, that we go by and check on them every other day for 30 days, or we call them and say, did you take your meds today? How are you feeling today? You know, these are the kinds of things that will keep them from having to go back to the hospital. You even see here in some of the lists here, um, the health assessments that we can do for physicians. And so what you can see already, I'm sure, is that all of these services, and you're thinking, well, who's going to pay for that? And who's going to monitor that? What's the relationship that would allow me, as a, a firefighter medic, to practice these types of things? So we're going to talk more about that shortly. So continue with some definition here with mobile integrated healthcare or community paramedic. The program then really can be designed to free up some of your emergency response units. And what we're discovering actually is that some of these programs are perfect places for some more of your mature paramedics, we'll call them, right? Those who are not yet ready to retire, but their bodies really do need a break from lifting the stretchers and doing transports consistently all, you know, all the time, every shift. And so this is a great place to put some of our, um, again, more mature paramedics um, or EMTs so that they have a place uh, to still serve, to still operate in the EMS arena prior to retirement. Um, so typically what we're seeing in fire departments is that they are setting these up separately from the emergency response units, of course, and that actually we're taking care of some of the patients who typically would have called 911 for something that wasn't truly an emergency. So we are actually freeing up some emergency response units. And then, of course, the scheduling for some in-home evaluation. We talked a little bit about this to go by and do even some pre-surgical type evaluations, to go by and do post-surgical type evaluations, uh, wound care, all of those sorts of things that can be done outside the hospital at a much lower cost than having someone go into the hospital. So even to um, expand this to some things that we already know, we can do continue to do public education, outreach, CPR training, um, even some of our fitness and wellness programs in the communities to, uh, to expand the scope of what we do today, to add quality. And what we refer to it, um, you know, at the IFF, it's value added to the services that we provide. And so what are the needs in your community and what value can you add within the framework of resources that you already deploy um, to, to provide something else to that community, to meet a new need that we haven't met in the past and thereby again add value to who you are and what you do. So with that, um, some specific opportunities. We mentioned some of these already, so I'll sort of just mention a couple of these. Transportation to an alternative facility. You know, in many states today, that is not an opportunity for emergency response units. If you transport a patient from an emergency scene where you've responded uh, due to a 911 call, you can only transport them to a receiving emergency room and a hospital. No transporting them to an alternative like a um, urgent care center, to a detox center, to some sort of social monitoring type um, halfway house or something like that. So we are required to take them to hospitals. Well, what if we could take them someplace other than the standard emergency room? We already noted that there was an um, overrun, if you will, of the emergency rooms. And so if we can reduce that population by, doing, by sending them somewhere else, that's going to help out and also drive down costs again, right, which is one of our criteria. The post-discharge monitoring we talked some about to keep these, um, these patients from going back into the hospital. Now, I haven't mentioned yet, but many of you that are familiar with the Affordable Care Act would know that the Affordable Care Act has a segment in it that says if a patient is transported back or is, has to go back into the hospital, is readmitted to the hospital for something for which they had been admitted, and discharged in the last 30 days for the same type of um, ailment, then that hospital can not only be will not only be not paid for the services, but also would be fined. 
uh, for that. So the hospitals are very, very interested in having this post-discharge monitoring of various um, types of patients, particularly diabetics and COPD, because I've already mentioned to you that these are two of the higher cost centers that we have in emergency medicine, in all of healthcare, frankly. And so these are um, two of the types of patients that we want to continuously monitor. Cardiac, uh, post-cardiac um, type surgery patients are also another group that have to be monitored, make sure they stay on their prescription regimen, make sure that their diet is monitored, things like that that we can do just with phone calls and checking on them. Again, a value-added service from the fire department to the community. So um, one of the things that I should mention here, and you see it in one of the bullets on this slide, are the demonstration projects that are now in um, pilot stage for the most part being funded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid or CMS by the federal government. And these demonstration projects are in progress and we're beginning to see some of the data coming back from them. And I, I will hold on that because that's a, almost a, a whole other presentation. So to continue on to give you a bit of a uh, more of a framework of this new paradigm for Firebase CMS, let's, let's move ahead. And what I will tell you at this point is that we certainly are not alone in our quest for delivering value-added services. And by that I mean the private ambulance companies have made it no secret at all that they are moving very fast, very furious um, into this arena. And so with that, um, they're looking at the savings, they're also looking at the revenue, they're looking at the relationships that be made because revenue from this type of service is not going to be paid in the traditional way that we know. Some could be for Medicare and Medicaid depending on what it is, but a lot of this will be paid from agreements contracts that you make, relationships you set up with the hospitals or with an accountable care organization or with a another type of a facility. And so the funding for this or the revenue that can be had is again coming from a different source. And you can see the need that a hospital might have if they contracted with you to go check on all their post-surgical um, patients, their cardiac patients, then to keep them from being readmitted, you're taking care of them outside the hospital environment, they pay you to do that, that's much cheaper than them not getting paid for the service they've already delivered and also being fined. And so this is where some of the revenue is going to be coming from. And so the private industry, the ambulance uh, industry is very, very interested in this. So we may be a little behind in the fire service because uh, they are are moving forward very quickly. I'll show you some examples here. This is uh, from uh, M AMR. You can see here Envision Healthcare is their new pioneering the delivery of healthcare. So they were ready to stand this up just about when the Affordable Care Act was passed. And so this is a whole branch where they are ready to deploy. Uh, they have deployed in Las Vegas and they do community paramedic where they're going in checking on patients keeping them from calling 911 to begin with or going and checking on them after they've been discharged from a hospital and so that's one here's Falk um, that's the new competitor in the US um, competitor of AMR and they also launched a, um, a new program called access on time okay so it's looking at the right time the right place for healthcare delivery Right? And so everything from, you can see it there, air, rail, motor coach, ambulatory, wheelchair, air ambulance, all of these things they're doing, but also uh, coming to you with translators, interpreters. So they really are taking this to the next level to be able to go and check on people in their homes, to make sure you get to an alternative facility should you need it. All these types of things are happening. And so these two companies already have something. But it's not just the private ambulance company. We're also seeing these being stood up from hospitals themselves, from these accountable care organizations that are being stood up. They are um, putting people on triage on computer. You can call in. You can send your vital signs even over a computer. You can talk to a physician directly. So there's all sorts of uh, systems that are being set up for outside the hospital care. And these are things that we could do, but our competition continues. Take a look at this one. Uh, another transition advantage, right? This is sp specifically your post discharge support. So look at this gentleman in the picture. If you can see, there's a blood pressure cuff. So what they did when they discharged him, along with 
his discharge orders, you know, we always get that, tell you which medicine to take, what you can and cannot do when you get home and for how many days and when to go back and see your physician. Well, along with all of that, they gave this gentleman a package, including a blood pressure cuff that is, is uh, uh, self-monitored there. They gave him a little log to be able to log some things, and they tell him, how often to do that and then log on to your computer, hook this right into your computer and we're going to monitor you from here. Uh, so this is the kind of technology, these are the kinds of services that are being stood up uh, in the light of some of the services that I've told you about and the opportunities that were set up uh, uh, based on the Affordable Care Act. Here's another one, Walgreens, you may have seen these. Not only they set up to do uh, mammogram services, and they've done that for many years, but have a look at this. They're driving around now, health tour, focused with ARP on the elderly. Okay, and so this is an entire population that if they deliver service here, the elderly, again, on a wellness-type basis, they can get paid for some of the services they deliver out of this mobile clinic, okay, to Medicare, right? And so they have an opportunity to bill for some of the things that they deliver in the field. And you can see community, right? Uh, right down the side of that, if you can kind of focus in there, um, free health tests and services for your community. Okay, so this tells you they're not going to do any balance billing beyond what they might bill Medicare. Um, your AARP insurance may cover, you know, those sorts of things. So these relationships, these connections are absolutely key to delivering this type of service. Here's another one, CVS Pharmacy. They're cutting back. Here's the wellness thing I told you about. One of the things that we're seeing in the Affordable Care Act is that there is, uh, there's revenue to be had for fitness wellness programs. So CVS is setting themselves up to move toward that. All right? They're looking at even a loss in sales due to tobacco but they are focusing on health care. They're not concerned about two billion loss in sales of tobacco. They're going to pick it up in revenue on the wellness side for the wellness um, initiatives that they're going to be starting. So other players, who, who else might be out there? Well, insurance companies. You can watch for some of the, uh, maybe the Prudentials, the Aetnas, some of those companies to begin to stand up their own operations that if you have that type of insurance, I can tell you Kaiser Permanente as a managed care organization, um, HMO, that sort of thing is already standing up these types of situations. They've had a, a hospital triage or a nurse triage system for a very long time. Not different from what we're talking about today. Have a call and talk to a nurse, they coach you through and you stay home rather than going to the hospital. Um, come in, they make you an appointment, you come in, so rather than calling 911, you're going to be um, going through a triage system. Assisted living companies, home health care, all of the, these types of players are in the game. So, with all of that said, and that bit of background, what can fire service leaders do today? Where do we need to go? If you haven't started already, you need to get moving. And so, what we have to do is take a look at our operational prioritization. What are we doing? How are you responding? And to what are you responding in the, the fire department today in your community? And everybody is different. In Florida, we have huge, huge numbers, up to 85% of the volume, coal volume of fire departments in Florida is EMS. Whereas if we go into um, some of your um, that's because of the elderly population there, by the way. And we're going to some of the other arenas, like a, uh, a Detroit, for example. They're high. Um, they're going to be about 65 to 70% EMS, but they still make a good bit of fire, okay, in that city. Same thing for Pittsburgh. Same thing for New York, Boston. And so we have to take a look at what are the operations, what types of calls to respond to, how do we set up our um, operational um response to continue what we do, but also take a look at our EMS responsibilities and what is new in the community. Remember I said, what kind of needs can you meet? What kind of value added services can you provide your communities? And so there's a market needs assessment that has to be done as well. So what are these needs? Um, what are we doing currently? What are the needs in the community? Okay, so that's two things that you should be doing right away. We also need to begin to look for any legal or political obstacles because in most states in the U.S., uh, in every state virtually, you're going to have EMS regulations. They differ. And so you need to know what you can and cannot do in any given state. 
right? So there are going to be restrictions that apply. And I'm going to come back to that because I have a couple of slides on that in just a moment. But I'll mention operational readiness here um, since it's showing up on this slide. So what kind of expanded services can we do within the resources we have? Are we going to have to add capacity? Do we need more staff? we need more vehicles? Is there additional training required? If we're going to be billing differently or have contracts with hospitals, what kind of expertise do we need to bring in? And so those are all kinds of things that you can be thinking about as well. So here's a, a couple I said we would come back to the state uh, EMS regulations and I'll give you a couple of examples of what you need to, to have a look at before you can say, oh, we can just go and start a community paramedic program. For example, in Virginia, this just came out, a um, notice to all uh, EMS providers in Virginia, EMS agencies I should say, including the fire departments, that any of these kinds of programs, and they call on mobile integrated health, you'll see the MIH slash CP there. Uh, will require or may may require licensure as a home health care organization. So basically they're saying don't think that just because your license is an EMS agency you can go jump right into delivering something outside. What is your typical scope of practice? Same thing in Ohio. Okay, have a look there. Uh, Ohio law allows you only to perform emergency medical services. And so these laws, um, same thing in California, have a look. It's got to be um, approved, okay, if, if you're going to change scope or be delivering. And most of it is going to be because your scope as EMS providers is defined within the 911 emergency response. That's where you are licensed to provide care. If you're going to be providing care outside of that environment, then there may have to be some regulatory changes in your state. And so we've seen some of this in the past. Uh, state of Florida, again, I'll mention them. They couldn't even take blood pressures uh, in the fire stations as people, you know, wander in and say, oh, can you take my blood pressure? Because they were not allowed to have patient contact outside a 911 response. And so we had to change that. And so this is something that you need to be very aware of as you look at providing these types of programs. With that, you're going to have to do some financial modeling, have a uh, look at startup costs, what are your operational costs going to be, your profit loss? You're going to do this for no additional revenue because you just want to provide something else to the community. Continue to meet the needs uh, with that value-added service uh, and, and drive up your value you know, to the community. And some departments are, in fact, doing that and not looking for additional um, revenue. Those who are, however, may look at these partnerships that are mentioned here, from the hospitals, the ACOs I mentioned to you, even the public health arena. Uh, you might find some partnerships, um, say, delivering vaccines from the hospital, or excuse me, from the uh, fire stations now, something that traditionally may have been done in a health department clinic that we can do from the fire stations. And so it's a little bit of a shift now, but a partnership that could be had in some of your communities. So if you move along and you say, yes, we do have community need. It is a need that we can meet. We have resources to do that, okay? So what then do we need to deploy? So assess the need for other services other than what you're doing today with your emergency response, treatment, and transport, and then say, how do we then move to that? So the initial terms of any agreements here, whether it's just some change within the department or whether you're going to begin looking for some sort of um, partner, like an ACO or hospital, physicians group, that sort of thing, the very initial terms are going to be very important. So let's take a look at some of that. If you're considering an agreement uh, with another organization to explore these partnerships, you really want to get uh, some professional support. The, another way to say that is an attorney, right? And so we really want to have uh, some sort of legal counsel. Look at the areas mentioned. Uh, your partners can range at, at some all of the groups that I've mentioned to you previously. And then you're going to want to have a meeting, establish a meeting with an executive of the organization. So if it's a hospital, you're going to want a uh, fire chief, maybe a, a couple of representatives um, of the top senior management of the fire department, some you may EM, EMS chief perhaps. Go and have a meeting, a sit down with the hospital administrator, explain what you're prepared to deliver for them, what you can do for them, uh, value added to that hospital that will add value then to the community. So um, again, moving forward, take a look. Can you lower their cost? Going in and tell a hospital I can cut your cost, uh, particularly on your readmissions, 
your post-discharge readmissions is going to be very attractive to them. So that's the kind of thing you want to look at. There may be um, public-private partnership available. So if you're talking particularly to a private hospital, you're going to need to have a look and see whether or not you as a fire department would be able to contract with a private entity. So there may be some local ordinances you have to deal with in that arena. Um, you're also going to want to consider, again, a method of reimbursement. So if we're talking to a hospital, you're going to say to them, you know, every um, post-discharge patient will go have a look at them, but every time we check on them, uh, whatever you uh, wish us to do, and your physicians or medical directors will design a post-discharge um, assessment, if you will, we're going to charge you $200 or $250, whatever, um, you know, whatever number you might come up with as a flat fee uh, per service call. And so those are the kinds of things that you really want to think through as you're thinking through this type of health care. There is a resource that I want to tell you about, um, our Firebase CMS Toolkit. This was recently released. I hope most of you have seen this already, but in case you haven't, I just wanted to see you. And I've also sent a, a link for this to Dr. England so he can share that link with you after the presentation as well so that you can download this. This is an electronic toolkit. Um, Chief Compton and others, I'm sure, in the room there um, were very instrumental in helping put this together. So as we put this together, it only, not only gives you the basic Firebase EMS tools, uh, just a regular kind of EMS, right, but also um, talking points, some of the things that I'm going through with you now, as well as electronic links within this toolkit that you can click on these links and they will provide you many, many resources to assist you as you move forward in trying to plan these types of programs. So wanted you to know about that as well. So just a little bit of a summary here for the next steps uh, for departments preparing to move into the community paramedic type services. So you want to do a needs assessment. What does our community need? Because the services that you provide may be very different from services another department and another community would provide because your community needs are not the same. And so don't think that there is a template for community paramedic program. There, there simply is not. So will it be expanded scope? Are you going to look at prevention only? You need a medical director. You must have a relationship with a physician. Okay, one that's going to encourage you here. We don't need uh, physicians who are going to kind of squelch this idea when you're trying to move forward with um, with changing these types of programs. You may have to do some additional training with your medics. Remember the legislation uh, or state regulation that you need to consider. Look in, uh, at identifying the contacts and the other agencies uh, that you might partner with and then building those relationships and looking for reimbursement. So that's just a quick little um, summary of some of the things that I've already gone over with you. I want to give you just a couple of examples of fire departments who are doing these programs as we sort of get to a, a wrap up point here. A um, couple of examples, Kent, Washington. So Kent Fire Department has uh, started their 911 prevention program, they call it. And what they're doing is taking a look at what we would refer to in the EMS arena as frequent flyers, right? Those folks who call uh, 911 almost every day, every other day, right? They call the same thing. They want to go to the hospital. And many times what we find is that they're lonely. These are elderly patients. They're lower income patients. They may not even have, you know, they may not have food, so they go to the hospital because they want something to eat. Um, so there are various reasons that, that these folks are calling frequently. And so if we can stop some of that by caring for them before the call, and that's the kind of program that Kent Washington has set up. So that's what they're looking at. They do use nurses. They're using paramedics, EMTs. They also help navigate those patients who do need care once they get there to the right setting. So they're trying to avoid sending someone to the ER who doesn't need to go to the ER because, remember, it's very expensive. And so we want to to be able to send them to the right setting. So that's what their program is doing. Um, and they are not charging right now. They're simply doing the value added to the community to meet these needs. McKinney, Texas, another one. They started their pilot uh, in June of last year. So they've been operational now um, just about a year. And they deploy in pickup trucks. So these are vehicles. These are in addition to their fire apparatus, right? And they're doing uh, home patient checkups again for their frequent callers. They're preventing that call to 911 that literally would waste your 911 emergency response resources if I can send a cheaper 
um, vehicle, first of all, if I can send trained personnel to go there and prevent this call and make sure that patient gets to the appropriate care, I also cut the cost that would be experienced by their insurance, by Medicare, by Medicaid, the emergency room, all of that gets reduced. And so they're setting up a program that will allow them later on to do some reimbursement uh, billing should they choose. They have two medical directors who are very active in the program. That is going to be key. And they are very, very savvy with their quality assurance. And so they keep checks on this program. Salt Lake City, Utah, another example. Um, they're doing a, what they call a light response for our low acuity patients, those who are not emergency patients. They're not emergency patients, basically. And so they have 40-hour employees who meet with these frequent callers. They go by and check on them. Um, they're usually referred by our frontline providers. So you make a 911 call on these folks. You know they don't have an emergency situation, but they do need help. Maybe it's a social worker. Maybe it's somebody to come by um, for an elderly patient and just uh, safety proof their home. They've got multiple electrical wires. They've got throw rugs on the floor that are fall hazards. You know, things like that, that they, they do need help, but it's not an emergency. And so that's what um, this program is taking a look. They do have a difficult um, situation with homeless in this area, and so it is making it somewhat difficult because a lot of the population they need to follow up on who don't have emergency situations, they don't have fiscal addresses either. And so our 911 responders are still handling much of those calls but um, they are operational with their program as well. And the last one that I'll tell you about is Mesa, Arizona. And uh, that fire department has been just tremendous in trying to build their program using a nurse practitioner um, and a, a captain or a paramedic, firefighter captain, uh, together. And they call it an urgent care on wheels, right? And so they, um, they team up, they respond again to low acuity patients. These are not your 911 cardiac arrest, your major traumas, or things like that who clearly need to go uh, an emergency response to a, uh, an emergency room. These are low acuity, low level emergencies, and they're sending them out and caring for these patients uh, prior to them going to a 911 response. So with that, I hope that this has enlightened you some. Again, I so wish I were there with you. I know that you may have some questions. Please uh, feel free to email me questions, but I know that Chief Compton is in the room, and so he is also very, very well-versed in community paramedic and uh, knows well the toolkit that was put together, so I'm sure that he would be able to field some questions now, uh, Dr. England, if you wished him to. So with that, I will bid you all goodbye. I wish you well for the, uh, the uh, rest of the symposium. I miss you all. Take care. Bye-bye.